he kind of like emerged out of a corner, staggering. And he was like looking out towards us. And he started like touching his face as if he could see his reflection. And then he went, I'm so beautiful. And then he collapsed. I wanna preface this video by saying that I wanna make sure that my take on Bad Kind and the nightlife scene in Berlin doesn't only skew towards the negative. I had a lot of great times. There were a lot of really creative people. You know, just because I'm exposing some of the darker sides of what my experience was doesn't mean that I'm writing it off entirely. Anything I say is just my personal truth. It doesn't necessarily apply to everyone. Others are free to have completely different opinions and experiences of the place and of the scene than I did. Thank you for your comments on my last video. Based on what you said, I hear that you wanna hear some of the more crazy things that I saw inside of Berghain and while partying in Berlin. So I decided to make a list of 10 of the craziest and most surprising things that I experienced in that world. Number one, starting off strong, the pee monster. So in Berghain, in like a few of the toilets, the, the urinal is a trough. It's kind of this long metallic trough and everybody lines up and there are no dividers or anything. Sometimes when I would go to pee, which already, you know, when you're like on drugs and stuff, it's really difficult to make that happen for me at least. Um, and sometimes I'd be standing there for so long, just kind of waiting and trying to figure out how to make it happen. And then I would see this face appear and just slide into my view down at the bottom of the ur urinal. And it was this guy and he would be looking up at me with his mouth open and he would be giving me kind of asking eyes, like asking for permission. And, you know, I guess it's up to the peer whether they want to like indulge this guy's fetish or not. And so you could either like kind of give him a gentle like no thank you or pee on him and in his mouth. Urine still contains the drugs that you've taken. And so the gossip of the town was that that guy was like high as a kite off of the drugs that other people had taken that had passed through their system. The Pea Monster. That's my name for him. Number two. So there's this party that happens at Bad Kind called Snacks. And it's this kind of men only, very sexual leaning party where they open up the entire club and they connect it to um, the basement laboratory or lab, which is more of a strictly sex club. And, um, and it's this kind of like extravaganza. So I think I went to Snacks twice. And one of the times I went there, they had built a giant boxing ring in the middle of Bagheim, the dance floor, the techno dance floor. And so, you know, you're in this like industrial space with these vaulted ceilings and you see kind of like an old fire escape of a, of a building wall that used to be an external wall with windows cut into it and there are lights inside of the windows and stuff. Very cool lighting design. And then in the middle is this giant black boxing ring with like shirtless men kind of dancing in the ring and leaning against the the cables and stuff like that. And like, I never saw, I don't think there were any fights. I think it was just like, because people find athletic situations a turn on. Um, so that was a surprise walking into Bagheim and seeing a boxing ring built. Okay, the third thing that I don't really know if this is true, but this is my suspicion, is that there are cameras everywhere. That's my mindfulness bell. I'm so healed and recovered, oh my God. My sense is that there are cameras everywhere in Bagheim. And the reason that I say that is because, firstly, there's a very strong, unspoken rule that if you want to do illicit substances, you'll go to the bathroom and you'll go into the bathroom stalls. And most of the time, anytime drugs were taken or shared, it was in that environment or maybe in the dark rooms, which if you don't know, I'll get to that. That'll be my number four. I remember one time, it was very, very late at night. I think I had been there for 12 hours or something. I was there with this, friend of mine who was visiting from out of town and we were so exhausted and lounging in this kind of like, there were these cushiony corners that you could sort of find around around the bend and in these surprising spots. And so we were sitting in one of those and we decided to like share some illicit substances. And within seconds, a bouncer appeared with a flashlight, confiscated it from us, threatened to kick us out and then didn't because we seemed really embarrassed and overwhelmed and confused and harmless, I think. But I learned my lesson that I think there are cameras everywhere and that that's why everybody does their drugs in the bathroom stalls because that's the only place where you can't put cameras. Number four is the dark rooms. So I mentioned that in number three. Uh, if you've never heard of a dark room, a dark room is like an area of a club that the lights are low usually 
and where you can go to have sexual encounters. And they can be different place to place, but often there's sort of like a lube dispenser and condoms hanging around for you to grab and um, a lot of people kind of hooking up. And Bankheim has a few different areas like that. And so I know since I left, they've opened like, they opened sort of an ambient floor called Zoila, I think it's called. Um, but that wasn't open yet when I was there. So on the ground floor, there were kind of these like labyrinthine prison, prison staircases. They really felt like prison staircases. There was chain link fences and concrete benches to sit. And so that was kind of like a makeshift dark room for a lot of people. And this prison aesthetic really like informed the sort of fetish of that scene. Then on Berghain dance floor, uh, you know, it's this big floor, there's a DJ on one side, there's a bar on one side, there's a staircase on the other side, and under that staircase, between speakers, is this kind of mouth of an entrance to another dark room. And it's this like circuitous tunnel and it kind of loops around and there might be like a, a bare bulb placed here and there, but mostly it's in the dark. I remember seeing people like, you know, taking out their phones and shining the light on the person in front of them to decide visually whether that was somebody they were like attracted to or wanted to hook up with. And then on Berghain dance floor, right outside of the dark room, usually was where all of the like leather daddies would cluster. So it was very much like that kind of portion of the floor would be like two dozen shirtless, sweaty, hairy men like doing the techno march and sometimes like making out. And, you know, sometimes it seemed like they were having a lot of fun, you know, like really out with their friends and chilling. Like it wasn't all scary and threatening or anything like that. Um, there were some good vibes for sure. Number five is that there is a thriving deaf community that hangs out in the techno clubs and in Bagheim. And I became friends with some of them. And um, I learned very quickly that techno is a great form of music for people who are hearing impaired because the um, beat is so physical, the way it pulses through the speakers that uh, it's possible for people who are deaf to feel the beat very strongly. And so yeah, you might be surprised, there is a thriving deaf community in Bagheim. And it was really cool to like get to know them and learn a bit of sign language um, and then see them having conversations on the dance floor, which is amazing because you could have conversations over the music because you don't have to hear each other. Number six is a crowd favorite. You might have heard it already, especially because Claire Danes, I think, spoke about this when she went on a talk show and talked about Bergheim. There is a secret ice cream shop inside of Bergheim. And um, I never knew the rhyme or reason as to when it would be open, but basically on Bergheim dance floor, there's this long bar, and then next to the bar, there'd be this little light. And I think it said a word. I think it said open or or come upstairs or something, but there was like a light that would be on. And if that light was on, you could go up this little metallic staircase and you'd emerge into this kind of like sheltered little ice cream bar. And there'd be a window where you could buy ice cream and you could order smoothies. I had many of like protein smoothie there because after those long hours, I needed like to replenish my nutrients. You could get coffee there too. The person working behind the counter was always like, super surly, which I thought was hilarious because they're serving me like gelato while giving me like a scowl. Um, sometimes they were nice, but often not. And if you're on Berghain dance floor and you look up, you can actually see, oh, it's this little kind of enclave that's built kind of up close to the ceiling. Maybe it, it used to be an office when the place used to be a factory. I have no idea. But yeah, number six, there's a secret ice cream shop. Okay, number seven is more of an ethos and an attitude than a thing that I saw. Among my friends who were regulars at Berghain, there was this sort of unspoken rule that like, Berghain is a place for you to have a solo odyssey of sorts. And so there was this really strong culture of like, you might show up with certain friends, but you're not gonna stay with them all night. And so, you know, and I remember hearing people talk about like when tourists would visit them, they would have to like train them Literally, these were the words used. Like I had to train him to be comfortable with me ditching him so that he could like have his own experience. You know, I've been with friends and I've stayed with them the whole time. I went back a couple years ago sober and I went with a friend and we stayed together the whole time. Like that's not the rule always, but I do remember this really strong sense that like, and I felt it too. When I was at Bagheim, if I was there with somebody, I hoped that we would both understand that we were not beholden to each other, that we were free to disappear and go off and have an adventure and maybe never run into each other again that night. 
maybe I would send a text now and then, like, where are you? But yeah, finding people was impossible. So it was just like, cast myself to the wind and see where the night takes me and have an adventure. And, you know, for somebody like me who like, really wanted to be included and involved, that was really challenging in some ways because I was like, well, where are my people? Where do I belong? But in other ways, it led to these amazing experiences where I met all these people and, you know, I hooked up with people, which like wasn't always positive, but that's a different story. So yeah, it's this kind of double-edged sword. Like you sort of have this freedom there, but then there's also this kind of counter anti-dependence that sometimes feels kind of cold and unfriendly. That's number seven the ethos of ditching your friends. Okay, so number eight is something that I found very surprising, which is that on Bergheim dance floor, the music is not actually that loud. So because they have these like function one speakers that are, you know, state of the art and, and of the highest caliber, you know, when it comes to sound fidelity, and because, you know, I also became friends when I was there with these sound engineers who were experts on like where to place speakers to have the, you know, best acoustic effect. Um, so because there's been so much engineering that goes into this sound system, as a result, firstly, there's like a sweet spot where when I went back a couple years ago, I brought my friend, where you're kind of right in the middle and the sound is balanced coming from all the speakers. And it really feels like this magical, like the music almost sounds like it's coming from inside of you. Um, you're at the intersection point between all the speakers. But the other thing is when you're in that spot, like I was able to have a conversation with my friend, not much louder than this. And so it's this really surprising piece where like the music feels so all encompassing, but when it comes to the actual like gain and volume knob, it actually doesn't seem that loud. My fridge just stopped buzzing. Hopefully that doesn't make a huge difference. Number nine is not just one thing, but it's a whole sea of things. And that is a sea of health goth hipster twinks. <laughs> so there was this like dress code when you go to Bergheim, which is like, goth in the sense that you're wearing mostly black, maybe little bits of white, but health goth, which means, you know, sportswear brands. So like turning sportswear brands into an edgy kind of um, underground look. So like you'd see girls in sort of black sports skirts and like high, you know, platform leather fetish boots, you know, or people in latex, but then like a sort of baseball cap, like a very kind of gay but sporty baseball cap. You know, a lot of people who had taken their shirts off and they just had basketball shorts on. Like, and there was this attitude of like, just be so casual, but so cool. Like either when you went to Bad Kind, either you had like a look together where you're like, this is a fucking look. I'm head to toe in this like interesting aesthetic, or it's like, look really chill and kind of punk and underground. But like health goth was sort of a term that I learned when I was there. Somebody in the comments in the last video said like, okay, dude, I don't know, it's not that deep. And I would say to that, like, yeah, except that when I was in Berghain, I would have these conversations. I remember there's this one friend of mine who like, he would wear these fairy wings on the dance floor and he would just like start talking about philosophy and Immanuel Kant and how people go to Berghain to like face the void and, you know, and people go to Panorama Bar, which is the upstairs dance floor that's more like house disco and then Berghain is the techno floor downstairs. He would say people go to Panorama Bar to be happy, but people go to Berghain to think and process their trauma. Like these were things that people said about these places. So like, yeah, I agree. It's just like a place to go and have fun. It's not that deep. And yet it has such a powerful mystique for people and people really treat it like a spiritual experience. People called it, I'm going to church. Every Sunday, the gays would be like, I'm going to church, are you coming? And it was sort of an ironic joke thing, but in some ways, like it became more than that for a lot of people because they really treated it like a spiritual experience. And there is something spiritual about being in a group of people who are on mind altering substances, or if they're not, they're, you know, part of this collective conscience that's like reacting to the music and the sweaty and the crowd and the group think. Uh, it felt very ritualistic a lot of the time. So I would say like health goth, philosophical twink culture, was like a really profound piece of my experience in Berghain. So I saved my favorite for last and it's pretty dark, but it really encapsulates this sort of strange, messy situation that I felt like we were in at this club. So one time I was in the dark room with a group of friends and somebody was passing around some illicit substances. And I remember this guy, he was like a you know pretty burly dude 
and you know, seemed to be in his like 30s, maybe 40s. He kind of like emerged out of a corner, staggering. And he was like looking out towards us, but it didn't seem like he could see us. It looked like he was looking at his own reflection in like an invisible mirror that we couldn't see. But he was staring right at us and he went, and he started like touching his face as if he could see his reflection. And then he went, I'm so beautiful. And then he collapsed. I mean, hit the ground. That was a, a memory that crystallized in my head that I will never forget. The people I was friends with joked a lot about collapsing. There was this nickname they threw around, Collapsella. Who's Collapsella? I saw you collapsing the other day. And it was this like kind of bragging rights thing of like how close you could get to collapsing that night became sort of this like trendy thing to talk about. Um, so yeah, a lot of flirting with the edge. I'm not trying to judge any of these people or write them off. All I can say is that like when I was there, it was sort of a dark place in my life and that place fueled a lot of that experience for me. Sound off in the comments if there's something else you want to hear more about. I am taking suggestions. This is an experiment for me. I am exploring this kind of side of YouTube. The last video seemed to get a lot of interest, so I aim to please. I'm feeding the masses with more of what they ask for. So yes, ask me for anything you want to hear about. If you have anything you disagree with, I'm happy to address that in the comments or talk about it in the next video. I think it's important to have many different perspectives and not just one. And uh, yeah, see you next time.